Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello, I'm Jeffrey Mishlove, and today I'd like to talk about unidentified flying chariots. I suppose another title for this talk might be Merkaba Mysticism. It goes back to biblical times, and it has to do with the vision of Ezekiel in the Bible, who had a vision of God, but the vision seemed to incorporate the idea of the throne of God itself, and it was flying, and it had wheels within wheels, and there were four animals, but they had human faces, and they each had wings. And it was the idea here was that somehow Ezekiel, the prophet, managed to ascend to the throne of God and describe it in terms that defy all rational explanation whatsoever, although artists have tried to capture this image many times in uh, works of art, and it does suggest an, an otherworldly quality that there's some other greater reality out there almost incomprehensible to the human mind. And out of this vision in the uh, early years of uh, the common era, around, around the time of Christ, really, there was a, a tradition known as Merkaba mysticism and amongst the Jews in Israel, and it had to do with ascending to the throne of God through the many palaces of God to reach the highest throne of the highest heaven. And there is this sense in Judaism, that when one is filled with the spirit, I think it's called kavana, the spirit of uh, intensity of prayer, that one's prayers rise up to the throne of God. But it requires a certain state of consciousness. You can't just mechanically repeat the prayers and expect them to rise all the way to the throne of God through the many palaces of God to the highest throne in the highest heaven. And later on in the Kabbalistic tradition, these uh, routes leading through the uh, spheres of the divine to the highest God and in the highest heaven became embodied in a diagram known as the tree of life, which uh, became very essential to uh, many forms of mysticism. And uh, the tree of life is uh, really much more complex even than this picture that you see here because we're only looking at one of four dimensions of the tree of life itself. Now, later on, much later on in the Hasidic Jewish tradition, there is also the notion that the great rabbi, the Baal Shem Tov, had a carriage, and he and his disciples would get into the carriage, and at night the carriage would fly all over the housetops to distant places where they would engage in various mystical adventures and meet strange people and often help them out in mysterious ways. Also, I think of that, the uh, flying carriage of the Baal Shem Tov is yet another offshoot or example of Merkaba mysticism, an unidentified flying chariot or flying carriage. So, let me also now to twist, add a twist to the story, talk about a man that I met, Donald Keyes, and he was a friend of my mentor, Arthur Young. Arthur had a deep interest in UFOs, incidentally, and I think he had known Donald Keyes for a long time because they were both active in the 1940s in the World Federalist Association. They had a vision for how the world could be organized after the end of the Second World War into different federations, an American Federation, an Asian Federation, a European Federation. And later, Donald Keyes founded an organization called Planetary Citizens. I know at one time, back in the 1970s or so, I joined Planetary Citizens. 
and they issued what they called a planetary passport. You considered yourself a citizen of the planet, not of any country. And that appealed to me a great deal. I think, you know, at heart, I am a globalist. And I believe global culture is very important. But uh, that aside for the moment, let's talk about Donald Keyes because he was the president of planetary citizens. You might almost say he was the president of the planet in some way. So later in life, he retired to the community of Mount Shasta in Northern California. This is a community which has an enormous amount of mystical lore associated with the mountain and many, many stories of aliens living inside the mountain and flying saucers that appear over the mountain. And interestingly enough, lenticular clouds form over Mount Shasta. It's a particular cloud formation. They do look just like uh, round-shaped UFOs. So, Donald Keyes uh, wrote an autobiography. It's never been published, but I have a copy he gave to me personally. I would like at some point to arrange to have it published because it's quite amazing. In his autobiography, he describes in great detail how he traveled on UFOs, how he was recognized as a representative of planet Earth, and the aliens who uh, supervised this part of the galaxy wanted to meet with him, and they took him on many rides into outer space in their celestial chariots. I regard this as another form of Merkaba mysticism, and I have to say, I've read the autobiography carefully. There's a sense in which Donald is describing these experiences as if they happened physically, that he entered a physical vehicle and traveled into outer space. But it's never clear to me that whether this was a physical experience or whether it was, let's call it a visionary or a dream experience. I think it was probably a visionary experience that was so intense and so real to him. It was, as I sometimes say, more real than real, more real than had it been physical, perhaps. That's my theory. And uh, let me put it differently. That's my hypothesis. And uh, I have a reason for having that hypothesis, which I'm going to come go into now. Many years ago, Back in the 1970s, after my first book, The Roots of Consciousness, had been published, I received a phone call out of the blue from a fellow, a chiropractor in the San Francisco Bay Area named Richard Girac. And he called me up and he said, he has a small organization, handful of people. Uh, he called it the New Frontiers Institute. And they engaged in an unusual form of psychic work. And he thought I might be a candidate for that work. And would I be willing to come into his office and let him test me to see if it would work out? And so I did. And he gave me a particular test. I'm not going to go into it now in great detail, perhaps on another occasion. Uh, it was a hypnotic test, and he took me into a hypnotic state and asked me different questions. And at the end, he said, I passed. So I got to meet the other members of the group. There was an engineer, there was a housewife, there was a, an accountant who was a former uh, B-52 <laughs> Air Force pilot, in fact, leader of a squadron of B-52s during the Cuban Missile Crisis flying right outside the Soviet Union. But that's, that's another story. Anyway, it was an interesting group of people, and we would get together and put ourselves into a mutual hypnotic state where we would, in effect, travel to distant locations. We said, let's go and we'll all meet each other on top of the North Tower of the Golden Gate Bridge. And then we'd, in our hypnotic state, we'd say, yes, we're here. We'd be talking to each other. And then somebody would say, well, you know, let's fly over to Africa Marine World USA. Let's visit the dolphins. And there we are describing ourselves in the dolphin tank over there. And, and somebody said, well, well, wait, wait, there's, because we're talking to each other while we're in this hypnotic state. I see a dolphin. It's a female dolphin. Her name is D, or it begins with a D. And she wants us to help her escape. She's all alone. She's depressed. She's separated from her mate. What can we do? 
We didn't know what to do. And so the session ended. And then somebody said, you know what, let's call Marine World and see if there's anything to this. And would you believe when we talked to the dolphin trainers at Africa Marine World USA, we learned that there was a dolphin there named Dandi who was sick and lonely and separated from her mate and kept separate from the other dolphins because she was cantankerous. And we said, well, let's see if, if we can do something. And we came, they invited us to come to the uh, dolphin tank and work with Dandi and send Dandi telepathic signals, do this, do that, we're here to help you. We would like to be able to demonstrate that we have a real telepathic communication with you. And we set up a study, videotaped, in which telepathic messages were sent to Dandi to perform certain tricks that the dolphin trainers knew that had been uh, taught to the dolphins and uh, to do it on cue, on time, as the telepathic messages were being sent. This experiment was very impressive. The dolphin trainers were uh, pleased to see it, and, and Dandi was actually brought into the regular dolphin show at that point and was allowed to be part of the community of dolphins there. Unfortunately, we were never able to free Dandi. But the point I'm trying to make here is that because we were a group of pre-selected individuals who had a certain capacity to engage in a, I will call it a group hypnotic process together, we were able to imagine ourselves doing things, traveling to the top of the Golden Gate Bridge, visiting Africa Marine World USA, but there was a psi component to it, a real extrasensory, telepathic, clairvoyant, whatever you like to call it, component to this experience. We didn't have a chariot, we didn't need one, but we might just as well have. We could have said, let's get into our chariot together and visit Africa Marine World. It could have worked that way. And individually, as well. People can rise in their prayers or in their dreams to the highest throne in heaven. But what keeps us from doing that? The group energy is very helpful because oftentimes when I engage in healing, for example, I find that I get distracted by my own materialistic, egotistic thoughts. How am I going to rearrange the furniture in the house? Should I buy this? Should I return that? Do I have an argument with this person that needs to be settled? And all of these kind of real world thoughts keep us grounded here on earth, you might say. But when circumstances are so arranged through the energy of a group or through the discipline of a single individual, then it is possible for our souls, our spirit, our consciousness to travel to all sorts of realms, realms of the imagination, but realms that may be more than just mere imagination. Well, that's my story about unidentified flying chariots. And what is the lesson for you in all of this? Where does your consciousness normally reside? What would it take for you to be the kind of person who could fly at will to locations of your own choice in your mind and perhaps more than just your own personal fantasy, but somehow really to make contact with these realms? Is this something you even desire in your life? And if you do desire it, what would you need to do to achieve that kind of, let us call it, Merkaba mysticism? Thank you for being with me.